Thank you and welcome to the Wells Fargo team. Hopefully you've all met me by now. Kirsten Newcomer, Director of OpenShift Product Management. I often focus on security as well. Um, so the Wells Fargo team is here to talk with us about uh, accelerating AI and ML workloads in the financial industry. And I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. Sean? Hi, uh, my name is Sean Bradley. Uh, been working in IT for a little over 20 years um, across education, healthcare, and lastly, finance. Um, Kamran Aranzad, uh, principal engineer at Wells Fargo, been doing Kubernetes at Enterprise for like 10 years. Good afternoon, uh, Vip Patel, been working in the financial services industry for about 18 years in various roles. Um, latest being uh, specializing in AI. Vip, if I can start with you, um, how is the financial industry solving customer problems with the use of AI both, and, and has that changed more recently uh, as Gen AI I'm, has become particularly popular? It certainly has. There's, there's many, many use cases for AI as most organizations are just starting to begin their journeys into, into AI, right? Most large organizations have started their journey by just doing normal customer service type um, activities, right? So think about um, HR activities. If you wanna ask a simple question, instead of picking up a phone and calling your HR rep, you can ask a question to a chatbot, right? And hopefully get that answer back relatively quickly versus having to wait, right? Um, and other things like, you know, I'm sure we've all called IT support at some point or another, right? Um, today, you start out with asking asking it a question. And, uh, you know, based upon that response, it can direct you in one way or the other. But again, it's not waiting on a phone. It's giving us that instant answer, hopefully, to, to solve your problem. Um, and then, you know, more financial specific um, use cases for AI. Uh, one is fraud detection and risk management, right? So a lot of financial services companies are, you know, basically like they have your data, like let's be real, right? So they know what your spending habits are and um, if you kind of go out of the norm, right, you get flagged, uh, you'll get a phone call or a text message. And if you don't, think about switching um, your financial services provider because they should be doing that for you. Um, so, you know, that's that's one use case, um, you know, other use cases are just, you know, loan originations and, um, you know, for uh, and risk management there, right? So, a lot of times, um, again, like, you f you'll fill in your information and, you know, they'll come back and um, they'll, you know, either approve you, but most companies these days are not necessarily relying just on that, right? Because it is relatively new, right? So um, they're using it more as a tool. So you're still talking to a banker or a financial representative, um, and it just helps guide them on whether they should approve you for a home loan or a personal loan or, you know, whatever it may be, right? So there's that. Then there's, you know, just um, when it comes to trading, right? Um, a lot of times you can go in and you can put in your uh, your risk profile and based upon your risk profile It'll do that analysis for you and give you a suggestion again just suggestions at this point on items that you can invest in um, So there's lots of use cases um, that the financial industry is really looking to explore um, I would say they're not all completely relying on AI at this point they're using it more as a tool that will evolve um, as we get more data, we learn more, um, and you know, b basically just do a study of, of what the outcomes are. Thank you, and I, I have to agree with the comments about if you're not getting fraud alerts, um, you might want a different credit card provider. I personally have benefited from fraud alerts on my credit cards. Um, I know in the EU there are differences, different rules about data uh, sharing, et cetera, but, but I've certainly found that helpful. Um, and, and I think, uh, hey, if you can get faster loan approvals, that, that could be a win. Um, so, uh, Sean, could you tell us something about uh, the tools that you've been using, how OpenShift helps to build the AI platform uh, and what particular features have been useful for building the AI ML platform with OpenShift? 
Absolutely. So, you know, I feel like it's a two-part answer just because you have Kubernetes itself, which is a pretty steep learning curve, right? Um, but with OpenShift as a product that you can purchase, you really get out of the box all of the uh, enterprise features, um, ease of deployment, uh, authentication, logging, observability. Um, but then the second piece of that is the ecosystem of operators that can extend the platform for say like an AI ML environment. For example, Red Hat also has OpenShift AI, which allows you to add data science pipelines, uh, Jupyter notebooks, you know, everything that a data scientist would need to get started with their AI ML journey out of the box. Great, thanks. Has it been helpful that uh, you can leverage kind of the same Kubernetes platform for AI-enabled apps as well as other types of applications that are being used? I, I believe so, right? Especially from a uh, process perspective, automation perspective, and then even operationally. We already have an operations team that understands and can support enterprise-wide Kubernetes. Adding, building another platform on that for AML, just you can reuse all of that knowledge. That's great, thank you. Um, so Kamran, uh, I know you started working with uh, OpenShift 3. I forget which version exactly. I think it was 3.2. Or 3.6. I know 3.4. Maybe by the time I met you, it was 3.6. Um, so Kamran uh, and, and the team he was working with helped to drive, I want to share, uh, Upstream helped us at Red Hat to work with the Upstream on uh, the ability to encrypt sensitive data in etcd, actually. So... <laughs> so. Yeah, I think a, a long, long journey since, since it, then. It a, lot of, a lot of new tools that <laughs> so. definitely, I think, you know, a few have been spoke about already uh, in the yeah. industry, right? ACM, generally GitOps, I, I don't think there was much of that. Back at that point, there was a lot, lot more Ansible, right? And a little bit less, I guess, declarative. Um, so a lot of the tools that we see being used in the industry, ACS, ACM, um, you know, things that might not be in ACS yet, in OPA, um, things that we use for our or industry for compliance and controls, right? Um, part of the AI platforms that are being developed on OpenShift, you need a stable, I guess, base layer um, for these things, right? Uh, policies, controls of your platform, you don't want to have to worry about whenever you're trying to deploy your AI platforms or the application team way at the top, right? So we benefit, or the industry benefits from the flexibility and extensibility of Kubernetes, specifically OpenShift, and a lot of the tools in the Red Hat ecosystem that, I guess, integrate nicely um, with Red Hat's deployment, um, ACM, to make sure that we have the observability, the deployments of all the arbitrary YAMLs for compliance or policies or things like RBAC, um, token timeouts, whatever might be required for your PCI encryption, uh, and, so on and so forth. Yeah, and one of the things we've talked about previously is um, configuration drift and managing configuration across different flavors of clusters. If, is that something you could elaborate on? Um, yeah, so configuration drift, obviously GitOps, the declarative nature of that, knowing that what you provide in your source control will be actually out there in the environment across the fleet. I think that's really important to the industry. The reduction in overhead for operations teams, being able to actually reduce the number of headcount that might be necessary or at least have a greater number of operators who are actually uh, helping application teams or other services and not actually having to roll out all that configuration, right? Cool, thank you. And I know one of the you know related pieces too is admission controls. Um, are you using admission controls across a, a range of the ecosystem products? Yeah, I think like in the industry, you generally see a, a lot more admission controls being used not only to help the platform with any sort of noisy neighbors. I think like the last talk, they were talking about um, disruption budgets, which is actually 
really annoying for uh, upgrades. Um, so things like that, but also helping the application teams, you know, protect them against themselves with replica sets, right? Okay, if you have one replica, you do an upgrade. Okay, now you have some downtime. Um, so you see a lot more of that in the industry because people sometimes forget that security is also operational readiness and risk, right? Yeah, those are great comments. Vip, you've, as you uh, have been working on adoption of, or you know, kind of investing as the industry invests more in AI and ML-based applications, uh, one of the things we often talk about at Red Hat when it comes to innovation is the reality that you have to work with people as well as new tools, but also sometimes new processes. So what are you seeing in terms of the additional personas that are involved when it comes to AI and ML applications? Yeah, there's there's definitely new personas um, that are required when it comes to AI and ML applications. There are, you know, our standard set of personas. Let's just take our infrastructure admin, for example. Um, you know, they handle the compute, the storage, networking, you know, typical things that we all have to deal with, really any platform. So we've got your, you know, we've got our IT admin that typically takes care of uh, those types of environments and, and, and those systems. And then on top of that, we've got our, um, really our OpenShift or platform admins, right? They take care of the ecosystem from a platform perspective. So we've got OpenShift, we've got PVs, we've got all the security and the compliance that Kamran just spoke about. Um, you know, they, they take care of that side of the house. And then specifically for the AI side of the house, right, we've got a combination of data scientists and uh, data engineers, right? So when it comes to AI workloads, the data is extremely important, right? It's garbage in, garbage out, as you know, most of us has probably heard, right? So the the outcomes and the models that are created are only as good as the data that's being fed into it. So we have to have good data engineers to make sure that that data is cleansed, um, it's accurate, all the biases have been removed, and so those are the typical uh, jobs of, of, a, of a data engineer. And then once that data is, is created, um, that's where the data scientists come in, right? So they take that data and they use it to train the models, do inferencing, create RAG models, um, you know, do all of that wonderful stuff that they do to get the outcomes uh, that we desire when it comes to, when it comes to AI. That's great. And have you um, any uh, suggestions or tips about how do you help some of these new individuals, new, new personas come on board or learn what they need to know about uh, any new processes or working with the platform? It sounds like not all of them work with the platform, but some might. Some do, some don't. Um, but you know, I think with with most personas, it's all about communication, right? It's all about knowing what your requirements are and then communicating that to the different teams um, within the organization, right? Because without communication, the next team doesn't really know what they need to do, what they need to accomplish. Um, so you know, it's it's and in, in large organizations, sometimes it's it's very hard, right? It's it's a challenge. So just making sure you're communicating your requirements and your needs to the appropriate teams, that's extremely helpful. That's, that's great, thanks. Um, so we're kind of uh, leaving some room for some questions, but before we get to that, uh, maybe we can uh, go in order down the row and, and see what final thoughts uh, you might want to share. Sean, any key takeaways? or things you really would like uh, our, our peers here in the audience to know? Um. Yeah, I guess like the listening to VIP and then the previous speakers, right? The uh, ability of OpenShift and not even just OpenShift, but just using things like GitOps and Kubernetes and then having that enterprise support from OpenShift and then being able to swap components in and out as your needs change quickly, right? So if you're and then also like getting people on board, you know, setting the correct example at a platform level of how we're, you know, start out doing the right things and they can see, oh, platform team's doing this, it works well, why don't we try the same thing? Um, I guess to kind of continue on the same idea of what the question initially spoke about was OpenShift, Red Hat, like the support that's provided, uh, not working on only this FSI, other FSIs and being in the industry, um, 
knowing or having that confidence that, okay, uh, vulnerabilities will be patched, bugs will be fixed, um, having a partner or vendor that uh, is conscious of security, like I think SCCs, for instance, were uh, Red Hat contribution to the upstream. Um, so like that forward-looking security stance is really nice, helpful. Lots of the tooling is built around that, observability, auditability, um, things that you know, not only for FSI, government, uh, medical, right? So. so when it comes to AI, I would say there's no need to reinvent the wheel, right? So um, if you look at a lot of the reference architectures like NVIDIA has created, um, their reference architecture dictates open source queue. And then you have to put your own controls around it. Um, all the authentication pieces you gotta go figure out, you know, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work, it's not, it's not easy. Um, using a product like OpenShift does the majority of the work for you, right? So again, why go reinvent the wheel, right? It's, it's a fully supported product um, with AI. Uh, it gives you much, much faster time to market you don't have to worry about uh, managing and, and creating your own scripts and tooling and all of the other wonderful stuff that OpenShift gives you outside of the box, right? So um, definitely look into leveraging, you know, something like OpenShift. It has all the bits and pieces, including the operators that you that, that are required in order to uh, run the models. So um, if you want to do it faster, I definitely would go down that route. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, that, that reminded me. Uh, one more thought. Operators, really great, right? Like NVIDIA operator, being able to have any sort of drivers for the NVIDIA or OpenShift AI, uh, run AI, be able to distribute these through operators, be able to patch them quickly, um, operator lifecycle manager, all that, kind of from an engineering perspective, makes us look like wizards, be able to just move the fleet to a new version quickly. So. Awesome, thank you guys so much. And, and really thank you to all of you here for the partnership because we really do build these solutions in partnership with our community, your requirements, your goals, your needs. In some cases, your contributions to the code themselves really make, make a difference.